little over a decade ago on a cold fall morning between my relapse and my parents finding out about it, I was driving. I don't remember where to or why, but I'm sure it had something to do with drugs. I mean, I was awake, so. One of the many things I had learned in and about addiction recovery was if you walk five miles into the woods, you have to walk five miles to get back out. But five miles is a long way, and even longer when you're 20 years old. Arguably, the most relevant lesson to my personal experience was that when you relapse, you don't start over. You go right back to where you left off. Speaking of, I had a six-pack of beer in the back seat, a quarter of weed in my pocket, a pipe in the other, around a half dozen Xanax hidden in the mouthpiece of my asthma inhaler, and was never really sure what all was in my trunk. But it was enough to get me arrested. I was sure of that. I was also somehow miraculously out of cocaine. <laughs> Therefore, I was not high on cocaine yet. Uh, I wasn't high yet. Come to think of it, that's probably what I was going to do. I never got far during that part of my life without coke, which could have had a positive impact if I hadn't been so good at getting my hands on it. As I headed towards the highway, I thought about home. I had moved back in after I got out of rehab, and with sobriety, I had been able to start working on my relationship with my parents. My mother, the enabler, and my father, whatever's the polar opposite of an enabler. <laughs> it had been nice to be back in their good graces for a little while. A long dead piece had been revived when I did my outpatient treatment in the 90 and 90, which is a mandatory NA meeting every day for three months. But this piece just wasn't enough to distract me from the absolute misery I felt. A really fun thing about getting sober, especially as a young person, was the strong emphasis on completely abandoning everything about your life. You can't go to the same places. You can't hang out with the same people. You can't do the same things. I wanted to die, really. That made the most sense, considering it felt like my life was over. So a few months after my 21st birthday, which I reluctantly celebrated sober, I was finally able to justify risking everything I had gained back with my parents and eventually worked up the courage to take a hit, then a pill, then a drink, then a line. Things got weird at home when I stopped going to N.A. and started lying again. My mom and dad knew something was up, at least enough to cut me off and suggest I think about moving out. So without the emotional or, more importantly, financial assistance of my parents, going right back to dealing only made sense. Selling drugs was like a drug. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's definitely what I was doing that morning. I sped through a couple turns, and then I was getting on the interstate. The on-ramp was long and curved with plenty of road to build up speed, and I used it accordingly. It was early, but I was focused, and as I hugged the turn, boom. I'd never heard an explosion like this in real life. Once, as a kid, I lit a firecracker in my hand, and the fuse burned too quick. That was loud, but this was like holding a bomb. My ears were ringing so bad it took a few seconds to realize I wasn't moving anymore and a few more seconds to make out the car I hit. I could barely see through the smoke. It wasn't like the smoke I was used to, not sweet or pungent and transparent. It was more metallic and poisonous, a thick white. I looked over and saw the source. The passenger airbag had deployed, which would have been great if I had had a passenger. Mine, on the other hand, failed to open, and this is right around when my chest and ribs started to hurt. But this was no time for pain. I needed adrenaline, and I got it. I had developed a skill for doing everything I could to be able to not get caught and keep living the lifestyle I wanted. That is, if you can call a chicken running around after its head gets cut off, a skill. The beers had flown all over the car, and a few of them were open and exploding. I jumped up and out, setting the cans on the street, quickly turned, took the weed and pipe from my pockets, threw them in the bushes. 
On my way back, I noticed the car I hit looked as bad as mine, but I didn't have time for that either. I made sure all the beers were out and then grabbed my inhaler. From a distance, it just looked like I was medicating in a high-stress situation. I was actually pouring all of the illegal Xanax down my throat so I wouldn't have them on me. <laughs> Technically medicating a high-stress situation. <laughs> Within a minute or so, people from the strip mall across the street started heading over, the first being a tall, well-dressed, middle-aged man who looked determined to insert himself into the equation. The type of person who's never done anything wrong and can't understand why anyone would. I knew as soon as I saw him, he was going to be an enemy. I thought of my dad. <laughs> this guy was yelling at me before he even finished crossing the street. I saw what you did. I just stood there and imagined the worst. Despite my ability to ditch the drugs like I'd practiced this a million times, I was still injured and in shock. I didn't even respond. Yeah, yeah, you were driving drunk and speeding and you probably killed someone and I'm gonna tell the cops as soon as they get here. And on cue, I heard the sirens. I felt a different kind of weight on my chest and with nowhere else to turn, I called my mom. She had done her best to stand by me through all of the chaos, where my dad, on the other hand, couldn't take it anymore. And I understood. I think it hurt him too much to see me destroy myself again, and he had ended up at a place where he just didn't want to know. As the phone rang and the sirens got louder, I remembered that they were on vacation, but knew I had to talk to her before the cops did. She answered and seemed happy, which made what I was about to say even harder. Mom, I'm okay, but I just got in an accident and I have beer in the car. I wasn't drinking, but I have been using again and there's a lot of stuff in the trunk and the cops are on their way and I don't know what's gonna happen. And without missing a beat, she said, okay. <laughs> I could feel her smiling through the phone. Did you hear me? I asked. And she responded, yep, sounds good. <laughs> what the fuck? I froze. Do I have brain damage? Is the phone broken? Am I cutting out? What's happening? She continued, okay, well, dad and I are on our way to breakfast, so let's talk later. Oh, okay, I see. As it clicked in my head, I croaked out, I am so, so sorry, Mom. Okay, right, well, we love you too. I'll tell Dad you said hi. <laughs> Mom, I'm sorry, but she was gone. I'd apologized to her so much throughout my life, it felt as natural as breathing, but more like breathing in the cold because you can see your breath and think about it more than usual. I hung up as the police marched up to the scene and the citizen's arrest asshole started answering questions they haven't even had time to ask yet. This kid was driving drunk and speeding and he hit this poor woman. I took a deep breath and prepared to speak to at least try to defend myself, but I didn't even have to because all the other witnesses saved me. They jumped in and insisted to the officers, no, 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 no. That's not what happened at all. And as they revealed what really happened, I did my best not to faint and or look as guilty as I'd felt up to this point. <laughs> Apparently, everyone had seen this crazy woman, for a reason on known only to her, reversing quickly down the on-ramp. Our cars met at the turn, and the asshole must have only seen the aftermath of the impact. It wasn't the first time I'd been profiled. I acted like a punk and looked the part, so in retrospect, I can't blame him for assuming it was the tattooed, pierced, exploding beer juggler's fault. <laughs> but at the time, it took whatever strength and cognition I had left to not victory dance and jump for joy. Also because there was still the matter of explaining the alcohol and praying that no one had seen me ditch the drugs. 
But at this point, the cops were much more concerned with the woman in the other car, who was now clearly the actual criminal here, and the man who had just been shouting nonsense at them while they were trying to do their jobs. No sobriety test, no search of me or the car, and no idea what was now in the bushes, my stomach, and the trunk. This couldn't have possibly been proper procedure, but I wasn't gonna argue. <laughs> the officers took everyone's statements as an ambulance hauled off the woman and it was over as quick as it started. I never even saw her face. My car was totaled. So combing for any and every shred of illegal evidence didn't seem even remotely suspicious. It just looked like a guy getting his stuff out of a car he'd maybe never see again. I very carefully made sure to get as much as I could, including everything in the trunk. A digital scale covered in weed and cocaine residue, <laughs> various sizes of baggies, another pipe, an empty bottle of illegal promethazine cough syrup, an almost empty Maker's Mark bottle, and enough cash to re-up. I wrapped it all in the sleeping bag I took with me everywhere, and the cops offered to give me a ride. I was close enough to home and scared enough of them that I declined. And they let me, which is crazy, Looking back, I was clearly injured in shock with the adrenaline quickly wearing off, and unbeknownst to them, the handful of Xanax was really kicking in at this point. <laughs> and there was probably a pretty good chance I wasn't gonna be able to make it. But on I went, a headless chicken. It wasn't five miles out of the woods, but it was a start. Thank you.